Sudan. Since 1952, this enormous African country has been struck by a civil war between the North and the South. One of the horrible consequences of this war is the revival of slavery. So there were, what, 414 slaves, so uh, it's 20, uh, 20, 20,700,000 Sudanese pounds that we owe you, or put it in his, okay, that's 5 million, that's 5. Six million. Fifty million. Thirteen million. Thirteen million. Yeah, we are here and you have come back because there are many people around the world who've heard about the suffering of the slaves in Sudan. I can only name a few, but I think of Bishop Caesar Matsalari and Bishop Makram Ghazis. And so many people have not only felt bad in their hearts about the suffering, but they have felt that they must do something, and they've prayed every day, and they have given money. So now you're free to go back to your villages to find your mothers and fathers and your husbands and your relatives and neighbors, and we wish God's blessing upon you and hope that you can live in, in peace and security from this day onward. The American John Eibner, who represents CSI, the Swiss organization Christian Solidarity International, travels about six times a year to South Sudan. During his visits, he buys back the freedom of women and children that have been enslaved. This is the wife of his brother, and this is his daughter. Ah, his daughter, and were they taken at the same time? One day, the same day, they were taken. When, when were they taken? And then, Warumwa, Saralpa, last year. And Warumwa? No, no, last year. It's not negative, but negative. Wato. Wato. And Wato. Uh huh. And so, have you seen the have you seen them since they have been back, or is right now the first time you've seen them? Right now. That was the first time. Very good. Well, we're very happy. No one knows exactly how many slaves there are in in, in Sudan, uh, but we have reasonably good estimates of the numbers, and we reckon that there are you know, over a hundred thousand chattel slaves in Sudan, that is slaves that are the private properties of private masters. And there are uh, many more uh, people who are subjected to 
slave-like conditions who have not been kept by private masters but end up in government-run concentration camps, which the government calls peace camps. Okay, Noor. Okay, shukran. Slave trading is a thriving business. Northern militias are raiding villages in the south for slaves, which they then take back to the north. They keep them in their households or sell them to other masters. A few Arabs in the north, so-called retrievers, are tracing the slaves and buying them. They then bring them back to the south, where these retrievers present the slaves to John Eibner, who is buying their freedom. CSI was invited to come to Sudan back in 1992 by the new Sudan, Sudan Council of Churches on a fact-finding visit. And uh, we didn't know an awful lot about Sudan. We had heard about, you know, that there's been famine and human rights violations, but we felt we must accept this invitation coming from the churches. And we came and we were confronted with a, an appalling situation, a, a great uh, you know, humanitarian tragedy. Uh, an appalling human rights uh, situation and felt that we shouldn't uh, just abandon Sudan after the visit and uh, move on to other things, but uh, that we should come back. And we've done that many, many times now. The work involves uh, documentation of human rights violations and we also deliver humanitarian aid, food, medicines, and we became involved in, in supporting the local community here to retrieve and to redeem those who have been enslaved. All of the, the money uh, that is used for CSI's part of this uh, uh, program comes from private donors in Europe and in, in North America. The uh, government uh, troops attacked another village, Angela mentioned, apart from the two north of, of Warawar, and we'll be staying here now until at 12 o'clock until the security situation in the area in which we're going is, is ascertained. Uh, because according to the information that they've received here, some of the PDF troops have moved in the direction in which we're going. One of the biggest independent organizations that supply all kind of aid to the South is the Norwegian People's Aid. Like John Eibner, they operate in the middle of the war zone. Their director, Dan Eif, has dedicated his life to South Sudan and its problems. The slavery issue is a big crisis in that part of northern Bara Ghazal, but it is only part of the whole pattern of the war in Sudan. The war in Sudan is economic, it's political, it is religious as well, it is social, it's historical, it's all of that, but particularly political and economic. And slavery has been used there to depopulate the area and to reduce the strength of the resistance, the southern resistance movement, by hitting at their, at their core area in, in Baragazal. This is the worst war since the Second World War. Two million people have died, four million displaced people, and a half million refugees. It's a war of genocide, of Islamic fundamentalist government, on the African Christian South. It is a war which is out to depopulate southern Sudanese, a population of seven million people. It's the most primitive and bloody war in Africa. <laughs> the northerners see themselves as Arabs and Muslims. They only form less than 30% of the population. They want all of the African Christian South to be part of their identity. 
But I even wonder if they did assume their identity, would they still stop the war? Because the resources are in the south. It's full of rivers, fish, it's agriculturally fertile. And then, of course, there's vast resources of oil. Uh, it has gold all over the south. So it's economically huge potential and a very small population. The Sudanese People's Liberation Army, SPLA, controls the south of Sudan. They try to protect their territory against attacks and raids from the militias and troops from the north. The SPLA has a close relationship with John Eibner. It seems they would do anything he asks. And the situation in the West County is normal now. Our forces are, are men in their locations. Very good. So you think we can continue with our program up in that area before we leave? Mm. Uh, okay, I will. I will uh, just give me a chance for tomorrow. I will give you a uh, green light to go there. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, Commander. Okay. Have a turn. Okay. Thank you. I, I I really don't know, but one could call the embassy, the Swiss consulate in in Cairo, as Johan has the the book, and he would be able to to do that. Okay, that's very, very difficult to say in a word why I am doing this, but I came in 1995, shortly after a slave raid, uh, sp spoke to victims, people who had lost their loved ones. We spoke to uh, people who had been captured in that raid and previous raid and had escaped or been uh, redeemed by their, their loved ones. And uh, I felt that I had to do something about it. I just couldn't turn my back uh, on this problem, these crimes against humanity, uh, and knowing what I, what I knew, I wouldn't have been able to live with myself if I just, had I just decided, well, I'm going to forget about these people and turn my attention to something else or um, have a more leisurely sort of, sort of life. Uh, but is there a list, list? of names mm -hmm. or... No, people are working. They're working on it. Yeah. The people from these 11 villages, are they still near their villages or have they all run away? No, they are there. So they're there, yeah, we can yeah. see them. So they're trying to build some tukus. Uh -huh, trying to rebuild. In Nairobi, Kenya, Father Kizito is running a project for street children. Besides this, he is responsible for several aid projects in Sudan. He watches the activities of John Eibner and CSI closely. They do this from so far only with occasional trips. They say they have a network of local people with local chiefs, and so it makes sense. But these are things also that can easily go out of hand. I, I admire the trust they have in these local people, but uh, Due to the other questions that are coming up of this number and so on, one, one is, I am basically doubtful. I have known many relief workers in the South who are not willing to talk about it uh, publicly or talk to the press about it, but uh, who have um, been aware of and witnessed uh, transactions in which the local authorities were palming off as uh, slaves, uh, children who had never, in fact, been enslaved, uh, so that they also got a cut of the money. I'm very sorry to, to understand that uh, there are other people trying to, to talk badly of the slavery that is being taken to this year, uh, because uh, this is the real fact. Uh, children are being enslaved uh, by the government and it is the policy of the Islamic government to see that small children uh, are taken to the Islamic school in northern Sudan or abroad in Arab countries. This is the real fact and it is there. And if those who used to criticize that the buying back of, uh, of children by CSI is a crime, uh, let them come with the alternative that the children which have been enslaved, thousands of children that have been enslaved by the, the government in Khartoum, let them come, let them bring them today. And then I think we will stop this because the children being brought by the CSI are the relief to the population that I have now, uh, that are under my control now.
John Eibner is finally allowed to visit the raided area to make a report on human rights violations. Meanwhile, a new group of 400 slaves is already waiting for more than a month for Eibner to come and buy their freedom. The group consists of only women and children. Their husbands and fathers have been killed during the slave raids. Men are considered too dangerous to be held as slaves. Knowing what happens to slaves, knowing the severe psychological and physical torture, you know, knowing about the rape, the beatings, uh, executions, uh, forcible conversions, um, I would have no qualms about paying some, uh, a, a, a raider if it meant that that person were free. <laughs> Hmm. What should one do? Leave somebody in, in bondage to perhaps be murdered, you know, to be raped, to have their, uh, for a woman to have her genitals uh, mutilated ritually, and to say, no, I, I'm not going to uh, uh, give somebody thir the equivalent of $35. That would be terribly immoral. I find that very muddled reasoning, uh, to say the least, uh, that uh, you should, you know, under a moral obligation to pay people not to commit crimes. It's the moral obligation of the state and the society and, and the public opinion at large to stamp out slavery. That's the moral obligation. And you don't stamp out slavery by paying people who've been proven to be slave raiders. Could, Angelo, could you ask, as a chief, how the horse came here? Was, how did this horse you know, get here? The horse came here for attack to attack the villagers. And when they clashed with SKL soldiers, so the owner was killed. The owner was killed. Is there any, would there be any identification of the owner? This is everything they have, his bit. What are you checking this? What did they have in here? The key to get it in there. As the key to get it in. The food, ammunition, yeah? Ammunition. Ammunition. Can you hear it? Can you hear it? Okay. Okay, not right. No, I don't forget it.
Well, let's take these off. There may be if, some. If, if you, yeah. you, you open this, then you may get his name. I think I can. Quran. Let's open this up. See what's I'm one. Yes, see, I, I'm, I'm afraid you I know what is this. You know? Well, let's see. Exactly, let's see it. <laughs> the Burhanin are young uh, Arab Muslim tribes, individual citizens, who are very young. They are all a team. And in this area, you are not considered a man unless you own a horse. So the government of Sudan knows this. And the first thing to provide is the horse. He will be offered a gun, usually a Kalashnikov or a Tulishi, then 50,000 Sudanese pounds, and two sacks of wheat or dough or whatever. This is to leave for his family. Plus that, he's going to benefit from selling the slaves and selling the kettles which he's going to get. And this is because it is his own property. That's why they compete on taking as much as they can. This is what offered. This is offered to them as an incentive. And they're playing a very major role for the government of the Sudan. They're fighting its jihad war. And they're convinced they will be brainwashed for a long time that this is a jihad war. They're going to fight the infidels. They're going to spread Islam, etc. Et These values make sense for us, very illiterate people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Yeah, you are. Wait a minute. Yeah, take care. Don't tell the favor. It won't be charged. Now we are all in. That is it. I read a copy of that. I know. This is this is very important because it says 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 This is who rules the decision. He, he makes the decision, actually. Yes. Yeah. Rules among you and make the decision. Mm -hmm. And that is because of his yeah. wisdom mm -hmm. and knowledge. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Back in. Okay. Yeah. It's relatively the it same. Very good. Same. It Let's is keep this one war. going. And, uh, yeah. It is related to war. Uh, That's right. It's war. Yes, yes. it is related to war. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Declaration. This is, this, this is the jihad, uh, jihad text. Jihad declaration. Yes. It is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is a jihad text. We'll I put don't it know put it no, 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 don't keep it out. Uh, you don't have to put yeah, I'll, it out. Yeah, I'll dig out. It was really destroyed. Yeah. But I get it out. I don't know what you're doing. I didn't quite get to work with the book. I don't quite know what I'm going to do. One cake and a royal cake. Quite like what I like. I don't know what you're doing. I like 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 what في <تصفيق> فنحن سدوا كله عشان نحن نحاول نمرق الأطفال اللي من المأزق اللي فيهم لأن الأولاد اللي بيشيلوا من هناك دي هو ده الخد لأن الأولاد اللي بيشيلوا من هناك بيشيلوا من المراحل من هنا ودي سوبر خلاص يعني جوه هنا عشان اللي أهلهم هنا ده دعم لي إنسانية Yes, 
as I started freeing 12 slaves, 25, 30 slaves per trip, now there are 5,000 uh, at a go. So uh, are they encouraging slavery? I don't know. Are they encouraging adoption more than slavery? I don't know if it's possible. Are they maybe encouraging people to cheat them? Because they say it is so easy to get some money. And um, well, the money they take is not so big because I guess it's in the, they pay something in the range of $50 per, per slave. So it's not a big amount of money as such, even if the numbers are big. But for the local people, for sure, that is a big amount. So the temptation for many to try to cheat and to sneak in and pretending to be a slave to get some money is very great, I guess. The uh, colleague has uh, told me that uh, she's done interviews this year with families in Bar Ghazal, and uh, the families told her that they uh, rented their children basically to um, pose as, uh, as slaves. Uh, they got a small amount of money. The children were gone not very long, and they came back, and they were they were happy with the arrangement. In 1999, there were children among the group of, of slaves, or so-called slaves, uh, who were living in the village, who were registered in their feeding center and had on the feeding center bracelet. And not only that, waved at the... Um, at the feeding center staff <laughs> because they knew them uh, during the buyback. So uh, clearly, uh, there are there there is a certain amount of padding going on, and we have no way of knowing because, of course, uh, nobody wants us to know uh, how much padding is going on. There is absolutely no evidence that uh, this is fueling the uh, the slave trade. If that were the case, of course, we would not uh, do it. And those who make this, uh, this claim have never yet provided evidence. We eagerly await them to provide uh, evidence. The evidence that we have points to the, to the contrary. If you uh, are uh, an entrepreneur, you will see an opportunity that if uh, a Western, and Western means rich, uh, organization is willing to pay $50 for each person, you greatly maximize your profits. If you produce a hundred people instead of one, or a thousand people instead of a hundred. The practice of the mass buying back seems to be counterproductive by now because uh, the uh, worry that it will actually cause people to uh, go out and abduct uh, new, new victims. It's what they ta uh, talk about as the, uh, the, in the invisible victim. You free one person and then the person who's taken him uh, hostage or slave uh, has an incentive to go out and do it again. They're being rewarded for bad practices. If what we were doing meant that more women and children were being enslaved, more villages being burnt down, more cows and goats uh, stolen, more grain stores uh, destroyed, the community leaders, the chiefs, the civil authorities, the religious leaders would say, let's not do this anymore. But that isn't the case. Uh, they want us to continue because they themselves know far better than people in ivory towers in, in, in the West that this is not a free market in slaves. Uh, that the important factors are military and, and political factors in determining how many people come into, into bondage, and that this is not, in fact, fueling uh, a, a slave trade. It's easier then to control, I think, if we 
yeah. if they're in front of us. Yeah. Wherever there is money, there's a risk of corruption. So responsible people do everything that they can uh, to minimize those risks. What we do is we fingerprint, especially now that the numbers are getting uh, larger. We've started a, a system trying to, to fingerprint uh, as many slaves as we, we can. Uh, build up a database of uh, fingerprints which can be uh, scanned and eventually compared. We also take uh, photographs. It's quite interesting that some of the people who are redeeming slaves now have started to photograph them and fingerprint them. I don't that think that proves very much because uh, several thousand or ten thousand um, people uh, have been uh, bought back before this was started. So you have no idea if the people that are being fingerprinted and photographed as first-time slaves uh, in 1999 or 2000 haven't been bought back two or three times prior to that process. They were very happy to see you today. We waited a long time to see you. And how did you all get here? Did you all come together? They were brought back here. Yeah. Is there anybody here who was not brought by them? At the time, I had a grand grand grandfather who was a very famous. His name is Zibir Basha. He is well known as a, a slave trader, but still, he was living with the Dinka very peacefully, very respectful, etc. But I think at that time, I didn't live that time. I don't know. But I, I think at that time, slavery was just considered normal. 
by everybody, nobody. Uh, but now, if you say slavery, everybody will shrink and will low. Like, what is going on? That's why now, uh, in the, uh, if I'm saying that the values of today are against slavery and slave trade, I'm right, 100%. Cannot say that. I had my grand grandfather, slave trader, but that had nothing to do with me. I have to assess my time and my environment and my. That's all. Tong Maduk Mo. Tong Maduk. I think it's been very, very good that uh, the different people that have been doing slave redemption have taken the press with them. Uh, that's been very educational for the international public to s actually see the children and the women who are being uh, bought back. Uh, to put a face on, on slavery. You certainly can't go into the areas where they're held slaves and, and film them working or anything like that. You, would, uh, you, you, would, you wouldn't be able to get out of Khartoum with a camera, much less to the areas where they're held slaves. The question is, do you have to redeem 5,000 people in order for there to be publicity? A no, you don't. The wives and children of uh, <laughs> these men were enslaved uh, about three years ago. And they and a group of other men from their village uh, followed some days after the uh, popular defense force to the north to find out where their wives and children were with a view to helping them yeah, escape. And uh, they did indeed find them in, in the town of, uh, of Merrim. And as they were trying to help their wives uh, escape, they were caught. <laughs> and taken out into the bush and had their arms chopped off with uh, machetes and, uh, and axes. Go closer a little bit. Can you just go closer? It certainly isn't staged for Western uh, cameras. There are people who are enslaved. We've seen ourselves some of the destruction. We've spoken to people who have witnessed the slave raids. We speak to slaves who have, uh, who have returned. This isn't done uh, for the cameras. The cameras help uh, in making this uh, terrible problem known to the outside world. What we're talking about here are crimes against humanity. You know, what's going on here is a very, very serious uh, matter, not only for the Sudanese slaves, but for hu uh, humanity. When a, a regime in Khartoum can systematically uh, commit crimes against humanity uh, year after year after year, and Western governments are eager to renew good relations with, with that regime. It's very important that the media is here to see what's going on and to inform the world. Otherwise, these crimes against humanity will continue um, and we will become, uh, in the West, numb to them. I think he believes in what he's doing. There is no doubt he must believe in it. And he may also think, you know, maybe he's also, I would have no objection if, you know, he says, okay, yeah, uh, Maybe I know that uh, the, maybe the great majority of those people are not real slaves in the, the strict sense of the word. But even if uh, freeing 5,000, uh, I'm free 100 or 50 or 10 that were real slaves, it's still worthy to do it. I would accept uh, an answer like that, yes. So I think he's, uh, he's trying to do his best. As it, it happened in Sudan, nobody uh, really is in control of what is happening there. And the, the, the country is too big, it's so vast. Two years ago, there was a great famine in the whole of Sudan, also in the Nuba Mountains. At that stage, some people in the Nuba Mountains, for instance, they went on their own volition to the government held areas and they were working for people there in a situation that is not very different from slavery. But it was done in their own will. 
So a lot of people are returning to the south because uh, conditions in the north are not good for them as southerners. They face a lot of discrimination. And uh, they would prefer to be with their own families and their own culture. So it's possible you get those returnees also in a, in a group. But you don't know because nobody is really staying on top of, of this or what the, uh, where the people came from originally or what their names are. There are now 25,000 plus, plus people who are not enslaved, who would either be enslaved now or, or dead. Uh, had this program not uh, gained momentum and, and uh, been able to, to develop. There have been over 25,000 slaves who have come back uh, to this area, who've been re reunited either with their families or if their families are no longer alive or here with their community. And that is uh, not a, a mean achievement. Uh, there is also, uh, in addition to that, the awareness that has been created uh, in Europe, North America, and Africa, that there is slavery in Sudan. I would like to see this attention be broadened to the whole of Sudan and to the whole problem. Because then we, we otherwise we fall into the, the, the very old risk that we elicit some money from people and they think that with, with $50 they saved a slave and then this uh, slave is put in a situation where in the next, after three months, he will die of starvation or he will be in a, in a situation that is really unhuman as much as uh, the situation was inhuman when he was a slave. This group have uh, you know, now been freed to, to go back. They don't have to stay in this area anymore. And so some of the relatives have, uh, have come and some of the spearmen, the holy men, according to the traditional religion. And so they have gone off and they'll go back to the places where they have been camped out over the past weeks. The redeemed slaves are now free to go back to their home villages. Most of them have to walk for many days without protection through the war zone till they reach their homes, where they don't know what they can expect to find. A lot of them don't even know if they will have a place to stay. Most of all, they are anxious to find out which, if any, of their family is still alive. <laughs> I've come to the conclusion that humanitarian aid in Sudan has become a disaster in itself, a palliative, putting a bandage on. I've been doing relief work for 14 years. I'm tired of it. It's not the solution. So the crisis in Sudan, the humanitarian crisis, is resulting from the politics. It's a political crisis. And you only solve a political crisis with a political solution, while we keep the people alive. A man in Sudan said to me, though it hit me very hard, he said, Dan, it's the same thing whether I die fat or whether I die thin, I'm going to die anyway. So why are you fat me up to die? Why not stop the killing? <laughs> I have been brought up since I'm a child in a town in the center of Sudan. It's called Kosti. There were Denka, Nuer, Shuluk, Atuka, Tabusa, Nuba, Shaigia, Jalia from the north, all the tribes. This is the environment in which I live. I love it. This is the Sudan. I love this environment in which we were all living peacefully. There are, of course, some quite a distant way, but we loved each other. And I tell you one thing, which is very important. We never felt different. In my town, the graves are the same. The Christian is going to be buried beside the Muslim, and the Muslim is buried beside the, 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 the Christian. 
and we go on burying the Christians, and the Christians will share the barrier of the Muslim, and they, they will pray. Each one is praying his own prayer. And I tell you something, this government could not change this. Despite this propaganda that they are very fundamentalist and Islamist, they cannot do that. They cannot prevent the people of the Sudan from continuing this normal life. I have great hope that things will be settled and uh, peace will reveal in Sudan. If there was no war, uh, it is uh, a little paradise. Really, is uh, with people that are welcoming, with people that are so kind. I think that Sudan is the country in the world that has uh, the highest number of recorded languages. You know, they say that in Sudan there are uh, 652 different languages. In the old world there are 2,500. So a quarter of the old languages of the world are spoken in Sudan. And to each language corresponds a different culture, a different way of dressing or a different way of going around naked. So, you know, all this is part of the fascination. Also part of it is for sure the fact that the Sudanese, in spite of all these difficulties, in spite of those, this problem, they are open to the outside world. They, 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 uh, they, their response to whatever little you do is so is so overwhelming and then uh, they take your heart and then uh, you have to go back uh, in spite of the danger in spite of the problems the human rights watch uh, position on uh, buying back of slaves uh, is is not as harsh as condemnation uh, but uh, because we we recognize that uh, some families have been assisted by it, but uh, the method that's being used now uh, is not satisfactory at all, and we're afraid that it gives rise to further abuses and encourages uh, bad practices and, and human rights abuses, encourages the raiding. Uh, buying slaves back will not end the practice. Most of the NGOs who are critics never come up here. Why, sh why do you assume that NGOs should know everything? A lot of them are very, very ignorant. People in the community are quite shocked with this kind of uh, ill-informed criticism that is actually very damaging uh, to the victimized uh, community, to the slaves themselves. Wherever we go, you know, the chiefs, the religious leaders, uh, mothers and fathers, uh, come up to us and thank us for the work that we're doing encourage, and encourage us to continue. Can you hang on to that for me? Definitely. <laughs> this is the victimized community. It is this community that is victimized by the slave raids. We're here to serve them. We've accepted their invitation to come and help them solve the problem and we'll continue working together with them uh, as long as they wish us to.